kwangu ingu ayedu hatinga chati kubudirira mwari alipa uti wipendura mbai mchirwa my hit is gone down don't touch the real hit is gone shine gone shine my people gone This thing is a real dog I play it fan off The cat was a They can't feel The wife try to console me Like it's coming baby Chill She don't understand I'm the only one that's real I remember the third grade Them kids they had waves I had them BDBDs You know that Zimbabwe ain't great So they do shades And your boy hit the stage Press play And all the chicks was like Yeah I was moving shit slick If she gave me calculus, gave her a mouthful of it He goes to this thing, boy, I bet on myself well, well, grand rising, everyone. Welcome to the day with Trey. I am your host, Trey Holiday, and I'm so excited because it is a fantastic Friday, first Friday in May. And for those of you who've been watching me for some time, you know, when we have the first Friday, we got to have Rashida Hatchet in the building. That's right. Rashida Hatchet from Rashida Hatchet Media is here. We're going to be talking about the ways that we can deal with loss and continue to move ourselves forward and get things done. So I'm so glad that she's in the building. Also, I'm excited because Naomi Andre is in the building, y'all. And the, the, the great thing about this is that Naomi comes with this entire knowledge base about opera. And so I am elated. Y'all know I have become a new opera fan and Naomi has this history that I get to dive into with her today. So it's going to be a great, fun, fantastic Friday for y'all. Of course, it is the top of the show. So it's a great time to tag and share the stream. That's right. Go ahead and tag and share this stream with folks you feel could benefit from a daily dose of dope right here on the day with Trey. If you can't watch us, we do have you covered because you can listen to us anywhere you find your favorite podcast. Just search Converge Media Network in the day with Trey. Y'all will find me on Google, Spotify, iTunes, SoundCloud, Apple Music, whichever one is your favorite. Search for us. Y'all will find us there. Kudos to all of y'all who are finding us and searching us. We appreciate you sharing our good work here on the day with Trey with those that you know could benefit from what we're doing here. I appreciate y'all. Of course, without further ado, though, it's time to go to the guru, Rashida Hatchet herself. Hi, Rashida. Hey. <laughs> Welcome back. It's so good to see you again. Thank you so much for having me. It's, you know, it's awesome to be here on a first Friday. Yeah. And I, I'm, I promise you, you're always just in the most fabulous get up. Well, you know. She said, I, I don't come to disappoint on this Friday. Absolutely not. <laughs> Absolutely not. Uh, well, you know, recently, uh, you know, we lost Elijah L. Lewis, yeah. my brother uh, in the community. And it is something that we are realizing, like, people deal with grief in a bunch of different ways. We yeah. deal with loss in different ways. But there, in my mind, I'm like, how would Elijah want me to push forward? Yeah. And we were doing so much work together in community that I think immediately I can't stop doing the work. Yeah. And so I'm so grateful that you could come on today. What are some of the things that folks can be doing, particularly when they have to deal with loss like this, but still have so much to do? Yeah. Well, I think one of the things that we really have to remember is that we all are going to deal with loss. Loss is a part of life. It's going to happen. But one of the things that's really challenging about it is we don't really learn how to deal with grief and loss. We don't have like a formula. There are rules to some of everything. But when it comes to grief and loss and trauma, there are no rules to it. There's not a book. There's no like handbook that says, you know, we go through this and then it's done, right? Grief is one of those things that it's not this linear healing. There are ebbs, there's flows. There are all of these things that happen on a daily basis that can take us from like feeling okay to, I don't know what happened. This, this usually isn't a trigger, but something happened and now I burst into tears and I am sad all over again, right? And so we have to give ourselves some real grace when it comes to how we deal with grief because it's not linear. It's one of those things that, you know, a taste, a smell, a place, right? A something, an object can really trigger us to be back in a place of I was really good today and now 
I'm sad. And first part of really understanding that is knowing that this is going to happen, right? Understanding that it is going to happen. You're going to have things that come your way that are going to set you back. But the key is that you can't stay in the setback, right? You can't sit in the setback. You've got to acknowledge what's happening. I know what I'm feeling. I know why I'm feeling it. And I know that I still have to keep going, right? Because the thing for us is that we still have another day. You know, our loved one that's gone, that was the end for them. You know, that was, they had completed their mission, right? We're still here and we still have a mission and a purpose that we have to keep moving forward toward. So we have to keep ourselves in a place of understanding that the mission has to keep moving with this person in mind as we keep going, right? We never forget about them. We hold them with us, but we have to remember to keep moving and it can be a real challenge, right? Well, I mean, part of what you're saying and what I'm hearing you say is if we are preparing ourselves for those ebbs and flows, Mm -hmm. we actually gear ourselves up to be able to move forward. Yes. You know, um, recently folks have been telling me because they know that I just I get to work. That's just kind of my modus operandi. Right. Like I just get to work. Um, But to be able to recognize within myself when I need to take that break and when I need to take that, that seat back, maybe allow others to kind of, you know, move things forward. I think that's also key to this, right? Absolutely. That's huge. Because one of the things we do when we're experiencing grief is we just like dig in and just start doing a bunch of busy work. We just start doing things. We're moving around and you'll see it in everyone that you know, you'll watch them. And at the beginning of when this bad thing happens, when we lose someone, you just see this person zipping around and they're just moving and they're doing things. And they're really just trying to get through the next moment. And that's their way. That's how they're doing it. So we do have to be so mindful of our own selves, like really digging into emotional intelligence. How am I feeling? What's coming up for me? spending some time doing some mindfulness exercises so that we can really be in a place of being in connection with who we are and what's happening. So we don't burn ourselves out or get to the place where what we've done is we put the grief on the back burner and when it gets ready to show up because we haven't dealt with it, it'll be at the most inopportune time. You're in a meeting at work in the middle of the meeting. Someone says one thing that you, that just triggers you and you lose it. Right. And that's part of that is not allowing yourself to deal with the grief and being in this place of busyness so that you don't have to think about it. So you can just get through the moment. Right. Mm -hmm. That goes back to just not knowing how to deal with grief. You know, we need to be in a place where we acknowledge what's happening. Right. We acknowledge what we're feeling. Do some work to write down what this person meant to you. Okay. What they meant to you fun stories, not just writing, I'm sad, right? Because that will keep you crying, but fun things about them, stories, things that they loved, things that remind you of them, right? Putting that grief in a place where you're looking at it, you're facing it face forward, and then you're moving through. Mm. Well, you know, I, I really appreciate you talking about mindfulness practices. I know that, uh, for me, my idea of like grief is oftentimes like, okay, let me be at peace. Mm -hmm. Right. Because I, I understand that peace, if peace is my natural response to all things, then it's my natural response to any challenge in my life. Right. And so we, we sometimes see loss as like, oh man, that's a challenge. Cause now I don't have that person physically with me right? knowing that they move on into another realm, but it's this idea of that constant connection that I was able to have Mm -hmm. right in this realm. Uh, But being uh, mindful that peace is my nature and that there are some things we can do right away, like smiling and laughing. Absolutely. That are kind of the antithesis, right? They're Mm -hmm. like the, the opposite of us just being like sad. So when we do that, when you, what you're saying here in in terms of like remembering the good times, being able to laugh about stories and memories, that's also really positive. And I think we don't talk about that enough Mm -hmm. in Western society to be able to know you don't have to just, be, you know, bawling and crying. Yeah. yeah. Maybe those times will come up, but you can also laugh and bring joy into the moment of what you were able to have with that person. Absolutely. You know, recently I lost my cousin as well before Elijah. And I was like, I think I was just kind of shocked by my mm-hmm. cousin's death. 
And honestly, I was like, oh my gosh, he had such an amazing smile. Mm -hmm. And at his service, you know, there were so many people that talked about his smile because yeah. he did. And it just lit up a room. And already, like immediately as we're there in the service, I'm like, yeah, just remembering his smile right. is making me smile. So there's this, um, this uh, amazing interaction of energy that mm -hmm. you gather when you're smiling and when you can bring yeah. on that positivity, even in loss. Absolutely. You know, the thing that we have to remember is that there's always a silver lining and it may not seem like that in the beginning, right? In the beginning of grief, you're not really sure why this happened, how, you know, what's going on, what's the reason, especially when we're talking about someone who's young, right? Someone who we feel like had a whole lot of life left to live and was doing such great work. Like why, why did this happen? And as humans, we're conditioned to figure out the why. And there really isn't a why in death. There isn't. There's no why. We don't know why it happened. We're never going to know why it happened. But what we do have to look at is looking at ourselves to say, now, what did I learn from this person? What did they teach me? What's make made me better now having yeah. known this person having been in community with this person and then we focus on those things because those are the things that give us that peace that put us in a place of being able to say i can be okay with this because i truly took everything that i could from this person from the experiences that i had with them from the memories and i hold those things dear yeah. and we were talking some weeks back about writing our stories yeah. we've got to help to write that person's story after they're gone and that's one of the beautiful things about writing down like what that person meant to you and keeping it because it helps you to heal but it also helps the generations coming behind you to know this person that left us before they came. Mm. And we've got to be better at that because looking at just, let's look at Elijah's life and all that he did. Like, of course, there's so much of it that's on Converge Media, which is beautiful because we've been able to chronicle so many things, but not everyone has that kind of platform, right? So we have to make sure that we keep that person here by writing down who they were to us, what they imparted in the world, what it was that they gave us that will never leave us, that we're going to pass down to our children and our children's children. And if it's that smile, if it's the idea that we can just be happy in the midst of loss, if it is laughter, whatever that thing is, we have to keep it, hold it dear, and then pass it down. There it is. I mean, you always uh, bring so much knowledge and wisdom Thank and you. It, it's beautiful to know that when we do these things, we're setting ourselves up to continue um, the work in a positive, healthy way. Absolutely. I think you're absolutely right that, you know, and, and I probably suffer from that where I'm like, I get to work, yeah. <laughs> you know, because I'm like, oh God, can't take my foot off the gas. Got to keep because, you know, my bro was here and this is what we we're doing. So that that is a driving force for me. Mm -hmm. But I really appreciate you giving some insight insight to how you do that in a healthy way absolutely so that it's not just the busy work and just trying to keep yourself moving so that you're not dealing with the grief there's ways to do that yeah. and move it forward Rashida as always a pleasure look right there let them know how they connect with Rashida Hatchet Media awesome so you can find me at RashidaHatchetMedia.com I am also on Instagram and Facebook at Rashida Hatchet connect with me let me know what you're up to and I'd love to chat with you all Oh, right on. Uh, phenomenal. I appreciate you and I appreciate these segments. So I can't wait to see you next month. Oh, me neither. I'm <laughs> excited. <laughs> oh, well, of course, we got to start off to a great start with Rashida. Always amazing. And we're going to continue this because Naomi Andre is in the building. I get to talk to her about my newfound love for the opera and really get her historical perspective and her knowledge and insight as to how we're doing it a little bit different up here for Seattle Opera. Y'all stay tuned right after this short break. You're watching The Day with Trey. COVID-19 hurt my income, my health, and my family. We were about to lose our home when we heard we might be eligible for homeowner assistance funds from the government. We called 1-877-894-HOME and a housing counselor stepped in. They talked to our lender and saved our home because falling on hard times does not have to mean losing your home. Federal funding details at WashingtonHAF.org.
What's up, everybody? You know, me and Besa, my girl, we had to pull up to Market Street Shoes once again, y'all. And you know, we do this every season. We have to get the new shoes, the new boots. And this time, I even got a coat. Yeah, no, you did walk in without a coat. I really I'm did. I'm glad you found one. <laughs> but their boots were on point. Yes, the boots. The bags. I even grabbed a flannel. Yeah, you did. You know, and I was able to get some hats and everything. I was really impressed. And you know, I was impressed because, of course, I got those white boots that you guys see me wearing everywhere these days. Yeah, no, I I look at your white boots and I'm like, darn it, they only have one pair. Me and Basie wear the same size. Of course, every time we walk out with several bags in hand. Several bags and sometimes even a backpack, you guys. Make sure you check out Market Street Shoes. Yeah, please check them out. Where they go, Basie? Ooh, 2232 Northwest Market Street, Seattle, Washington. Welcome back, everyone, to The Day with Trey. I'm your host, Trey Holiday. I'm excited because uh, although I am a new fan of opera, I've been told I have seen many shows, and it's giving me so much perspective. But Naomi is here to set me all the way right and give us even more perspective. Welcome, Naomi. How are you? I am great. Thank you so much for this invitation. I can't wait to have this conversation. Yeah, no, I feel like we may go over time a little. I'm going to tell you all that right now because... You have so much knowledge from a scholarly perspective, but also lived experience perspective. You know, just briefly, tell us about your history that got you to the position you're doing right now with the fellowship, right? Tell us a a bit about why you decided to get into opera the way that you did, Naomi. Well, it's a long story, but one thing that really helped is that my mother um, is an op or sang, had operatic training. She sang um, in churches when I was younger, but I grew up sort of hearing her. You know, I was a little kid in the background. She would go to different churches to special music, and she had trained as a coloratura soprano. So that's a really high soprano. Mm-hmm. So I was used to that sound. We're from um, outside of New York City. I went to college in the city, and I was able to go to the Metropolitan Opera and stand for five dollars. So it was easy. You eat lunch or dinner at the dining hall and then go to the opera. And a f- bunch of friends of I- mine went and it wasn't a big deal. And then I fell in love with the drama, the spectacle, the the excitement, all these goodies. And I'm so glad you're, you've like found it because I think opera can be really, it seems like it's an elitist form that only rich people and white people go to. And you know there are goodies in there that are wonderful and so exciting. Very quickly, I went to um, school. I studied music. I played the piano very badly. Um, I sang in choirs, and I just wanted to focus on opera and what was happening, what was going on. I would listen, and it would open up all these ideas. So that's how I got into it. I hosted, uh, I was invited to be involved with a few panels with Seattle Opera, and they said, hey, let's formalize this relationship. And I was like, oh, I'm a professor. How do I do that? And it has been wonderful since 2019. I come three times a season, and I, um, during the pandemic, I did a bunch of things online. And so it just, um, it's just ballooned and I keep, I'm so excited each time. It's like, they say, yes, come back. So I'm having a blast. I get to study opera, think about it, and then share it in ways that, you know, I write books and it's more academic. I teach, um, young singers, um, in, in, uh, academic settings. And I love talking to the public. I, I can't wait to talk to you more about this. Well, you know, we got into a really great discussion when we first met and we, it was like during an intermission, we didn't have much time, but already I was like, Oh my God, I was blown away with your knowledge of the history of opera. And you were sharing some amazing insights. I mean, what are some of those top points um, that you really love people to understand about some of the history based on what you've been able to learn? Well, the thing about opera is that uh, there are a couple of points. One, it's seen as something only in the past and that it's only for an elite audience. And the great thing is that because opera is performed live, unlike a book or a picture you 
see that doesn't change. We change, but it doesn't. In a performing art, our friends are in it, you know, people who are living right now. So even if they're singing Mozart or something from the 18th or 19th, early 20th or any, you know, any time in the past, it's embodied by us today. Mm. So there's a certain live energy to it. Another thing is, and this has been very exciting, is to realize that black folks, people who look like us, have been involved with opera going back to the 19th century. The project I'm working on right now, I'm writing um, a book, is looking at black folks as composers. Harry Lawrence Freeman is in the 19th century. Scott Joplin, who we know for Ragtime, he has a couple of operas. Tremonisha is the most well-known. We've got singers. There's Elizabeth Taylor Greenfield, who was born, we don't know exactly when, but on a plantation in Natchez, Mississippi, around 1809, 1811, and through a variety of things, she ended up singing for Queen Victoria in England in the 1850s. She also sang with Frederick Douglass and abolition uh, meetings. So, and this is just the tip of the iceberg. Opera does have a tough past. And until about 1955 is a good date to use when Marian Anderson was the first black person to sing on the Metropolitan Opera stage in a major role. She sang Ulrika and Verdi's Zumbalo and Mascara. And I say that because I'm a Verdi scholar. I wrote a Verdi dissertation. And there, so that's when we feel sort of opera was desegregated. It's been incredibly slow, but black folks appeared on stages in the US and in Europe. However, in the 1870s, right after the Civil War, there were a few all black opera companies. They, and like a lot of opera companies in the United States at that point, it opera's super expensive. They would pop up and they would go down. But there are two empresarios, two that, um, who's an empresarios, they put on operas. Theodore Drury from 1900 to 1938 sporadically had opera companies with all black folks. And then Mary Caldwell Dawson is another person working out of Pittsburgh for, and she founded the National Negro Opera Company. I mean, the fact that these things happened and I'm a musicologist and didn't know about it. Well, that was upsetting to me. It was like my own hidden figures moment, yeah. you know, where you've got the, the those black women who yes. are computer, the human computers for NASA. I'm like, we have this in opera. Wow. I mean, Naomi, this is exactly why I get so stoked talking to you because I am uh, one that loves to learn. And and because I have this foundation of being able to come to Seattle Opera, experience it, and then like you, I got really excited because I'm like, wow, we are on stage. We're doing major roles. We are a part of this uh, amazing performing art that before I was coming, I didn't really understand that we were a part of. Uh, you said something to me when we first connected about how exciting Seattle opera is, right? Like yes. there's some specific things that are happening right here that may not be happening elsewhere in the country. And you have a real insight and purview to that. Tell us more about that. You are absolutely in a great city to discover and find opera. So Seattle, since uh, I'll start with, like since 2020, with all the, the pandemic when we were all at home and the horrors that sort of came more into focus, the murder of George Floyd and many other things, a lot of, interestingly, a lot of artistic organizations, opera companies, ballet, um, symphonies, and well, sort of a lot of organizations in the United States realized we got to do more with diversity. Seattle Opera had been doing this for at least a decade before. And so that's what makes it really incredible. Not only, and there are many different types of things that companies are doing now. Some people are commissioning new operas and that's wonderful to get new stories, new, um, new talent, new voices out there. Seattle Opera, it's not an 
by chance. This is really deliberate. Even going back to the legendary Spate Jenkins, who was one of the sort of really helped put Seattle Opera on the map. And he's known primarily, or one of the main things, for doing a lot of Wagner, which is incredibly big, long, difficult. And Seattle Opera does it like no other company in the United States. But he also began to look at other people who could sing and do things. So a really exciting example I love to give is Mary Elizabeth Williams, who Spate Jenkins had in when Seattle Opera had an art young artist program back in the early 2010, 11, I think. Mm. And she has gone on to be a major diva, an African-American woman who's got a big, gorgeous voice. She was singing um, uh, Leonora in Trovatore. She sang in Tosca. And we got to see her this fall as Isolde in yeah. Tristan and Isolde, Wagner's opera. As far as I know, and I don't know everything, but I kind of keep my eye out for these things in opera. She's the first black woman to sing Isolde wow. on the planet at a major house. That is huge and she's amazing and that was Seattle Opera. We have Aidan Lang who followed Spate Jenkins and he commissioned A Thousand Splendid Sons mm. and also began to get sort of really looking at diversity in the company and then currently Christina Sheppelman is amazing just gangbusters in a really good way for having a staff behind the scenes in education, development, advancement, reaching out, what happens in the in the front of the house during intermission where there are these wonderful exhibits so people can look at them or not and essay so it's all it's amazing there's no other company that's doing this at the size of seattle opera and it's a thrill to be involved you know th this is maybe this is why i'm like so enthralled because there is a, a level of intentionality yes. that Seattle Opera is doing that I am experiencing, right. right? And you're so right because meeting the staff behind the scenes, and I'm like, you y'all are black, mm -hmm. you know? I'm like y'all are y'all are you know helping to make all of these amazing. You're Hawaiian, happen. you're Japanese, yeah, exactly. you're Latino, you're yes, I mean, you're Armenian, you're yes. The diversity is real, and you just mentioned two shows that I had the pleasure of seeing and honestly when i first saw that that the time length of tristan and isolde i said okay this is almost five hours long i don't know how i'm gonna do it and i told josh i said josh i was at the edge of my seat the oh entire God. time not only was it just i understood later that Wagner style is that long, extensive story. You know, they're singing for a very long time about maybe one element right. of something, but they're expanding on it in a way that allows the story to really build from one song to another. And it was so, oh my God, the set design and the costume. I was just enthralled. I really was. You are giving me goosebumps. <laughs> the fact that, because even long-term opera fans get a little nervous with Wagner because these hours are five, six hours. And yet you totally, I mean, with your first Wagner opera and Tristan is one of the heavy duty ones, you got it. Yeah. You you opened yourself up. You it wasn't your first opera, you know. Yikes, that would have been. <laughs> but right. you've been to some others. But nothing is like Wagner. And Tristan is kind of at the pinnacle of a lot of Wagner things. There's the ring, but Tristan is there, and you totally you realize things. Just you slow down your heartbeat, your pulse, and you're in the moment. And you sort of see, you let yourself be there. You're so yes. right. And in today's world where everything is super fast, just, you know, 140 characters, yes. two minutes, too long to read. The fact that we let, there's no other space like the opera house in today's culture, I think, where we can sit all together, turn off our devices and be there with the, the live music and you focus on something and there's a sense of you want it, you know, the audience is right behind the performance. We want it to work. We want to feel these things. And when you see Korean people, black people, Latino people holding your attention and doing the most exquisitely, aesthetically, acrobatically amazing music, you see these folks, you see us 
as more human. Mm. And it's, I just, you are the type of person where I'm like, okay, I want to like turn you into little musicologists, yeah. but you're doing so many other yeah. important things, but you get it. I, I do. And this is why I was so excited to have you on. I mean, the minute we started talking, I was like, oh my God, we're going to geek out. <laughs> but also you mentioned a thousand splendid sons and this was such a unique story. I really appreciated all of the, uh, boards that were outside to tell yes. what, what, what we were experiencing in the story, what was actually happening on the ground. And, you know, I think that in America, sometimes we don't focus on what's going on in the rest of the country unless it hits America. And I love the fact that I've been able to travel the world and experience other cultures in their space. And this is why I think it's so important for us to really find our way to be globally minded, because that story of these two women, you know, dealing with, you know, Taliban rule, just everything was so insightful and they did it in such a great way. I saw it as two stories, uh, you know, on this two sides of the same coin mm -hmm. when you had the younger woman that was married yes. to the guy, the older woman married to the guy and the, and, and their, uh, personalities coming out in every part yes. of that story. It was so amazing. You are so right. It was a bold and courageous thing for Seattle Opera to do also. And it seems to be a very good thing since there are a lot of Afghan people who live, um, including refugees here yeah. in Seattle. It's a tough thing because how do you represent another culture without sensationalizing it. And I think the story, it was based on Khalid Hussani's The um, A Thousand Splendid Sons, mm -hmm. the Arroyo Sadat, an Afghan director, really breathed life into making it come alive on stage. And you're right, it's a story that brought in these two women and their stories. There was first love, there was abuse, mm -hmm. there was having children, there was, <sighs> the feeling of what do we do when our country is making it hard for us to live there, you know, with the Taliban, yeah. there was, but there were all, there was the, the professor who had his books. I mean, we saw many different sides and it was, it was an incredible show. And I hope this opera gets picked up. I hope they bring it back yeah. because this is a story we need to see about Afghanistan. Afghan life yeah. and have those folks come alive to us in ways that you can't just get in a, in a book and you certainly can't get in a, you know, with news clips. Right. Right. Absolutely. It was, it was, uh, again, so insightful and I, I love your take on it. I mean, now I'm excited because Sunday I'll be at La Traviata. Yes. Uh, I just, I don't want too many cliff notes, <laughs> but just a bit about what folks can expect from this performance. Absolutely. Well, the story is based on a French novel by Alexandre Dumas Fee, and who's the son. Um, he wrote, um, oh, big family, he and his father, the three musketeers, the Count of Monte Cristo. This is La Dame au Camellia. Verdi wrote it in 1853. And so, and the novel was from just a few years before, and it was a play. So it was current of the time. And here we have a woman, La Traviata, the title character is Violetta, and she is a courtesan, demi-monde, she's a kept woman. And opportunities for women were quite different because women now can get education and, and sort of be independent. But back then it was really hard for a woman to be independent and have wealth and standing, especially if you're not born into it. But the story is about how, even though she is seen as somebody who is paid money for her love, it is a kind of serial monogamism, monogamy, you know, with different people. Mm. You see there's such a dignity in her when she allows herself to fall in love and then what happens and how society is just conspiring against her. You see her, even if she's in a society with people who have a lot of money and are high standing, she's the one who is sort of the true honest person. So the story has that timelessness. It's sort of the specificity within this universal sort of love and honor and respect and having a female character 
who is incredibly strong despite everything kind of against her. We also get to see in Seattle, the casting as Seattle has been doing for years, there's, um, it's a double cast, be so you've got a South African Violetta, an Armenian Violetta, the um, tenor and the baritone, the father and son. We have Korean singers. We have a, another African-American in a leading role. So you get the story about the 19th century that's traditionally only cast with white folks with a bunch of like a wider range. So we can see kind of that these these issues are being embodied by real people today. They still mean something today. Wow. Naomi, you are so fantastic. <laughs> oh, Sorry, I go on a lot. I know. I know. Don't be apologizing to me. I'm like here for it. I really want to thank you for taking time while you were here and uh, for, you know, your expertise. I'm so glad that you're working with Seattle Opera in the ways you are. I can't wait to stay connected and, and be in the next thing you're doing in the presence of what you do because you bring such a wealth of knowledge and I, I guess for me too I'm just I love the art form and I love learning more about it so I'm going to be connecting with you more because I love to be able to talk about these shows after I see them and kind of dive more into some of those nuanced details so just be on the lookout for my call. What a pleasure. <laughs> I can't wait. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you for being here. Wow, y'all. If y'all don't know how to get your tickets, you need to check out Seattle Opera. Check out the amazing work that they are doing. La Traviata is going on right now. You can get your tickets today. Just make sure you start engaging. If you're like, I don't know if that's ever been for me, just trust me. Go try it out and you will see. I get to wrap it all up, y'all. After this short break, stay tuned. You're watching The Day with Trey. What's up, everybody? You know, me and Besa, my girl, we had to pull up to Market Street Shoes once again, y'all. And you know, we do this every season. We have to get the new shoes, the new boots, and this time, I even got a coat. Yeah, no, you did walk in without a coat. I really I'm did. glad you found one. <laughs> but their boots were on point. Yes, the boots. The bags, I even grabbed a flannel. Yeah, you did. You know, and I was able to get some hats and everything. I was really impressed. And you know I was impressed because, of course, I got those white boots that yeah. you guys see me wearing everywhere these days. Yeah, no, I, I look at your white boots and I'm like, darn it, they only have one pair. Me and Basie wear the same size. Of course, every time we walk out with several bags in hand. Several bags and sometimes even a backpack, you guys. Make sure you check out Market Street Shoes. Yeah, please check them out. Where they go, Basa? Ooh, 2232 Northwest Market Street, Seattle, Washington. COVID-19 hurt my income, my health, and my family. We were about to lose our home when we heard we might be eligible for homeowner assistance funds from the government. We called 1-877-894-HOME and a housing counselor stepped in. They talked to our lender and saved our home because falling on hard times does not have to mean losing your home. Federal funding details at WashingtonHAF.org. Welcome back, everyone, to the day with Trey. I'm your host, Trey Holiday. I'm over here, like, buzzing right now. From my two guests, I got to give a huge shout-out to Rashida Hatchett. Of course, on these first Fridays, you know she comes to give us the gems. So I so appreciate her for being here. Make sure you check her out, Rashida Hatchett Media. She is dropping gems, and she got books for y'all. She got a bunch of help that she can give y'all. Make sure y'all tap in. And kudos to Naomi Andre for being here to dive in to this amazing history that we have when it comes to opera, but also the very specific and intentional ways that Seattle Opera is doing things different. Y'all, it's right here in our backyard. And I am telling you something that I experience, and it's not often that I get to do that because sometimes guests come on and they're talking about things that maybe I haven't been a patron of their business yet. Maybe I haven't gone to an event that they've gone yet. But 
what Naomi was describing is something that I've been able to personally experience as a new fan of opera. So I promise you, you will not be disappointed to go check out some of the phenomenal works that Seattle Opera is putting on. And I'm also excited because both of them are doing their part to see themselves as a part of the solution. I'm inspired by them. I want you to be inspired by them too. find the ways for you to do the same and see yourself as a part of the solution, y'all. For me, until Monday at 11 a.m. Peace. Converge Media produces culturally relevant content for Black and urban audiences. Our coverage is raw, transparent, and objective, praised by community leaders, government officials, and residents. Support Converge Media today via Venmo, Cash App, or PayPal at Converge Media.